now we can, okay. Morning once again, colleagues, uh, it's 10 o'clock and then we can now start with our session. Uh, my name is Meshia Mariana, the chair elect for IGBIS in this term of office. And then thank you very much for joining us at IGBIS this morning. Uh, IGBIS, you are interest group for bibliographic standards. Uh, today's session is titled Cataloging Ethics and Inclusivity. Uh, cataloging ethics concerns itself with moral principles and values that form the framework for cataloging and classification uh, practice. And then in this session, we want to engage and create knowledge awareness around the issue of ethics in South African LIS community particularly to catalogers and metadata description librarians to give thought to ethics and inclusivity in our practice, but also to develop a code for South African practitioners on representative and inclusive descriptive practice. Mm -hmm. This is a topic that is important not only to cataloging and metadata professionals, but to, to the greater library and information community as it concerns how we describe, classify and present information materials to our users. We believe that South African library and information professionals have much to contribute to this conversation. Uh, today, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Deborah Lee as our speaker. So I will now introduce her. Dr. Deborah Lee is currently a senior teaching fellow at University College London, where she leads the cataloging and classification module and knowledge organization module. She has previously taught information organization modules at City University of London and Charles State University, Australia. She has a PhD, PhD in library and information science from City University of London. Her knowledge organization has been published in a variety of research and professional journals in library and information science, including JASIST, Journal of Documentation and Knowledge Organization. Dr. Lee was the senior cataloger at Cotlot um, Institute of Art, London for 11 years, where among other things, she led the library's implementation of RDA, managed the classification scheme, and was responsible for cataloging strategy and training. Uh, Dr. Lee will help us to understand the importance of cataloging and classification ethics in our daily description practices. Uh, just a reminder colleagues uh, that the session will be recorded and then please feel free to type your comments or questions throughout the session in the chat function. Uh, I'll now hand over to Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee, the stage is yours. Thank you so much and thank you for that introduction. And I'm just going to do the sharing screen magic. We'll see, <laughs> see what happens. Okay. Okay, hang on. I will just waiting for it to disappear. Okay, go on, come back. Okay. And hopefully, can you see my slides moving forward? Yes, yes. Brilliant, yay. First challenge overcome. Okay. <laughs> so to start, I just want to say thank you for this amazing um, invitation to come and speak with you uh, this morning. Just checking. Yes, it's morning for both of us, um, both countries. Um, it was really, really exciting to receive such uh, an invitation and um, I'm really excited by the by the work that you're, you're planning to do. Um, I hope that um, I can offer some some general thoughts about um, cataloging ethics, but I'm also hoping to learn lots about um, South African uh, cataloging classification practices, which embarrassingly I know very, very little about. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to learning lots myself this morning. Um, before we get going, I should just explain that um, woe is me. Um, I have got COVID at the moment. I think I'm okay. My voice is a bit lower, um, but please forgive me if I cough or look a bit confused at times. I'm fine, but um, not quite 100%. So I'm, I'm sorry about that, but um, hopefully it will all be, all be great. 
So cataloging classification ethics, well, it's a really, really important um, part of our, of our working lives in libraries um, of what we're discussing, what we're thinking about, what initiatives and projects are about right now. Um, and I'm also going to talk in this in this presentation about how this is actually quite a long standing thing. We've got loads of cool stuff going on now, but actually um, people have been thinking and researching cataloging ethics in, in the broader sense for many years, at them, almost 50 years from you know, the first kind of really seminal text. So it's kind of interesting that it's, it's quite of a long standing thing, but there's so much uh, renewed interest in it, in it now, I think is really interesting. So when I teach, when I lecture, um, I find that the ethics of cataloging and classification and knowledge organization are really threaded through almost every topic, every module, and um, certainly every module that I teach, almost every week's work, every topic that I teach, somehow, somewhere, there is always an ethical consideration. And uh, furthermore, my students generally um, are really, really um, enthusiastic and engaged about learning about this area. And when they get a choice of what to write about, they often often pick um, cataloging topics. So I think it's really, really, um, I think it's a really a, a timely topic um, and it's really important. And obviously in professional life, as, as, as you all know, um, it's something which is people are thinking about, which is coming up. And I can only really speak about the UK here, but I would say that although ethics has been something we've been considering uh, for, for, for many years, certainly the years that I've worked in, in libraries, which is nearly 20 years now, um, I would say that there's a, I'd say maybe the last five years, there's been such a renewal of, of um, thinking about this and really trying to get things sorted and work through some of the many barriers which we will mention as, as we're going through. So I think this is a, a really important and, and timely topic, a huge topic and a complex topic, but I think it's something really timely about thinking about cataloging ethics uh, right now, as you know. Um, and although I am a lecturer now, um, as I said, I'm, um, I've spent many years as a cataloger and senior cataloger, so I've seen this from from the side of um, doing this on an everyday basis and having difficult decisions to make, quite horrible decisions to make sometimes um, around cataloging ethics too. So I hope to offer both of those viewpoints and um, both the kind of research teaching viewpoint and the professional viewpoint to this talk. So what am I gonna do? Well, this is a really, really big topic. Um, so um, what I'm hoping to offer today is um, an overview, a kind of structure navigation guide to this really big area of cataloging um, ethics. Um, I could talk about this for days, weeks, I think I'd do a whole master's degree about cataloging ethics. And of course, I'm not gonna do that. So this is really very much an overview. And what I hope is that maybe this will provide some context or some starting points for your discussion as a community about what you do, particularly with your uh, potential uh, code of cataloging ethics. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to do, but it's not complete. It's not exhaustive in any way. And so what I'm trying to do um, what I will be doing, I should say, is introducing the sort of the idea and the topic itself. Then I'm going to be splitting the talk into two sections. The first um, are it's going to be about the ethical issues with the design of cataloging guidelines and classification systems, and then talk about some of the thinking behind the ethical issues with doing that cataloging, indexing, and classification. Now, I think there's an important division between them. Sometimes think that catalogers get, you know, get people cross with them for things that they can't change because actually the ethical issues are with the design of the system, which they don't have any control over. So I think it's quite interesting and quite useful to think about them separately. Of course, they, they combine and they overlap in many ways, but I think it's quite interesting for our purposes to think about them separately, at least in this talk. Um, a few a few disclaimers. Obviously, I'm going to be drawing so much upon the UK context. So, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm really eager to hear about how some of these things may or may not manifest themselves in South African cataloging, but obviously I'll be drawing a lot upon the UK and possibly American context. So I've got much bias is going to be presented. Um, and second, I'm, I'm not ashamed of it, but I'm going to be drawing upon research as well, um, as well as sort of practitioner ideas and movements. So, you know, hopefully give some idea about some of the research that's gone on in these areas, too. I think it's really interesting to see how sort of the research and the practice go together. So let's get started. Um, so hopefully your, your screens have gone bright red. It depends. Sometimes this slide appears pink, sometimes red. I'm not sure. It's red on my computer. OK, so an introduction to the ideas of cataloging and classification. So the first question to ask is, what on earth is cataloging classification ethics? Now, this is a really interesting question, and you'd have thought we'd have an interesting answer. And I love the way that Masha introduced it, um, introduced the idea, um, had a definition there. Um, I think it's really interesting um, because I don't think that there is 
I haven't found one everyone agrees on definition of this. It's really, really interesting. So, um, uh, Melody Fox and Austin Reese write in an article in, I think it's 2012, where they're looking generally at the idea of, uh, of information organization ethics rather than specifically cataloging. They write, um, that no one really defines this. Now this article is already about 10 years old, it's quite interesting, um, but they say that there isn't really an agreed definition of what uh, cataloging or IO, information organization ethics is. They say that generally it's about something to do with morality. So, so right and wrong, good and bad, that kind of idea. But when they survey the literature, when they look at the literature, they don't find one you know, absolute watertight definition, which is really interesting. Now, if you turn to the um, American, Canadian, UK, uh, cataloging, uh, sorry, code of cataloging ethics, a bit of a mouthful. If you turn to that, and I know that um, links been sent, uh, were sent around to you about that, they do have a definition in there. Um, and it's really interesting because their definition is quite tight. Um, and their definition says it's about um, coming up with a framework for principles and values, something like that, uh, for those working in producing metadata and cataloging, something like that, I am paraphrasing there. Um, so this is really, really interesting. Um, I, I would say that that um, that is a kind of a bit of a subset of, of a more broader idea about thinking about the morality and right and wrong um, to do with kind of cataloging classification. Because the code of ethics definition is really saying, um, talking about the catalogers' responsibility and their kind of moral guidelines while they work. Um, and so what I'm going to present to you today, I think, is a much wider definition, which is to talk about, um, first of all, I'm going to be talking about some of the systems of classification and cataloging, so the design of those systems. So not just about applying them sitting in a library and cataloging books or eBooks or journals, something like that, but actually the systems behind um, the classification, the systems behind the cataloging, things like the design of RDA and the design of Dewey Decimal Classification. But also, I'm taking it a little bit beyond my own responsibility as a cataloger, um, my own responsibility um, and moral, um, my values and my principles, okay? So that's really, really important. That's a really important definition and it serves the code of ethics well. Um, but I'm taking the word cataloging ethics to be a bit wider and that fits a little bit more with the, with the research literature. So just to say at the beginning, we're talking about something to do with morality, right and wrong, possibly principles and values. Um, and it could just be cataloging, it could be classification and indexing. Um, and um, it really can, I'd say, it can Im involve the design of systems as well as decisions that we make when we're applying them. So um, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about catalog and classification ethics. But we hold on to the idea of morality in some way, people. Then um, I think we're kind of on the on the on the right on the right train of thought there. So defining it is not so easy. And the second question I've got on this slide, if you can see it, is why is unethical cataloging and classification problematic? And this is another really interesting question. Um, at first, the answer is obvious. It's wrong. <laughs> we know it's wrong. And many of us uh, are librarians because we do want the world to be a much better place and all things like that. So obviously, there is a personal, um, a personal morality and ethical stance that we all have when we go into, not all have, most of us have when we go into libraries, where we want to do things which are right and which are morally right. Um, but let's leave that aside and say that's not really enough. To, certainly to persuade our managers, senior managers, um, to, to do, um, to make big changes, which might cost a lot, to make things more ethical. So what, uh, why is unethical cataloging classification problematic for the library? Well, the first answer is that, of course, if you've got unethical classification, cataloging, terms which are really offensive in your catalogue, things like that, then obviously it's, it's really problematic for your users. Um, they will feel very disengaged. Um, they might not want to engage in the library. Um, they might engage with a library but feel, um, feel that they're not being included and that has an impact on inclusivity amongst your organisation, say you're in a university or a public library system. Um, they might disengage with the whole, whole system um, or the whole, um, whole university, it just goes beyond just what they might feel about the library. Um, and also it's not just the people affected, so if an offensive term in a catalogue um, affects one group of people, other groups of people will feel very strongly about that, um, particularly students, <laughs> university students, they'll feel very strongly about that. So even if they're not directly affected, they're still um, offended and they still want the, the, the library to be a diverse place. So you've got huge problems in store with your, uh, in terms of your engagement with users. You can do all of this work and put on all these initiatives and buy all the books in the world. But if you disengage them with your metadata, then you've got problems. And forget about it from just a moral perspective, but just from a kind of really hard-hearted, um, 
logistical strategic um, it, uh, framework perspective, um, then, then that is problematic. Also, you'll find that, as you probably know, that when you have uh, problems with, with ethics and unethical uh, practices, then um, things like um, class marks are really, really long, and that leads to lost books or you start getting students who want to talk to you about, maybe about the, the ethics, then suddenly you have a lot more work to do. Now, I'm not arguing that's a good reason um, why anyone should be persuaded to do ethical practices. That's a very hard hearted reason. Um, but um, if you need to persuade your senior managers, then you can also say that just from a financial time perspective, that unethical practices are problematic. So there are lots of reasons why um, unethical cataloging classification is problematic. Obviously it's just wrong, we know that, but if we, we move beyond that, um, we can we can demonstrate that it is problematic to a whole mission of the library and probably for a whole organization and possibly illegal as well. So that's a that's a good reason to do it. So it's really, really important. And I'm sure this is why everybody is really, really engaged and, and really putting so much energy into sorting some of these very long standing problems out, which is absolutely great. So I'm going to divide um, cataloging classification ethics into two, two kind of categories. Um, the first is the design of guidelines and systems. And by this, I mean, for example, the design and the contents of something like the Dewey Decimal Classification or Universal Decimal Classification or Library of Congress Classification or subject indexing. So uh, LCSH, if you use that, um, RDA and um, Mark 21. So basically the design of the systems, the sort of work done by um, sometimes employees, sometimes volunteers, committees, but all of that kind of work, the sort of work you don't generally do in your own library, unless you're designing your own classification, but the sort of work gets done kind of elsewhere or by, or by committees. So I think that's really interesting and um, there has been quite a lot of research on, on, on that side of things. The other side of this, which I'll talk to as the, as the last section, is the cataloging classification ethics around those people and those practices and processes of doing the cataloging and classification. Um, and I think that they're quite different. They kind of interlink, but they're quite different. And often, often the cataloging um, ethic decisions um, are based around how to apply the guidelines on the left. <laughs> um, but I would just say not always. Sometimes there are cataloging classification situations which are nothing about whether to use an offensive term from LCSH or not, but are actually something completely different, which has got nothing to do with your classification scheme or some shoddy rule in RDA, but actually, so I didn't say that, um, but actually um, are all to do with um, something completely different that only comes up when you sit down and catalogue something or stand up and catalogue something. So I wanted to buy the two because I think they actually go through different thought processes. Um, and just to say, codes of cataloging ethics, as we're brought onto that, codes of cataloging ethics generally are, are the run on the right. So I'll be talking about uh, the uh, recent UK, uh, US, USA, Canada code of ethics um, in the final section when I talk about the ethics of doing the cataloging and classification. So what does ethics apply to? Now, this is a really interesting question. What, what does it apply to? How, where does this extend to? What counts, as, what counts as ethics? Well, to start with, ethics can cover everything, um, but much of the discussion and many, sadly, many of the problems and our unethical uh, practices and our unethical systems, our classification schemes and our RDA things and, and things like that, a lot of it is centered around um, the treatment of marginalized groups. And this is where um, a lot happens. So, for example, groups based on race or gender, uh, sexuality, migration status, um, religion, disability, indig indigenous communities, uh, vulnerable groups in some way, uh, ge uh, geographic regions outside of the north, which may be something, um, maybe something that 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 is particularly um, pertinent um, to to you and your community. Um, I'd be interested to find out. Um, so often, what happens is the ethical problems in the cataloging come from um, the treatment of a group of people who are generally being marginalized anyway. Um, and there's some really interesting research on this. Um, I would love to talk about it more, but I'm trying to be very um, self-disciplined and not talk about it. Um, there is a whole bunch of theoretical literature. Um, I'd say, some people say, um, that Sandy Berman's book in 1971, um, I'm gonna get the title wrong, um, Prejudices and Antipathies, could be the words the other way around. Um, a book published in 1971 was kind of a, Good starting point for this type of literature. Um, but since then, there's actually been a lot of work, um, particularly I'd say that from the late 90s onwards. So possibly before we saw such big movements within libraries themselves, there's been a lot of research about this. And one typical approach is to take an aspect of critical theory, something like um, feminist theory or queer theory, and look at it and apply 
to what is going on in our library catalogues or what is going on in our classification schemes. And there's some really, really interesting authors on this. Um, Hope Olson and Melissa Adler might be ones you're familiar with. And I have put some a small bibliography at the end in case anyone wants to follow anything up. Um, that's one approach. Generally doing a deep analysis of a particularly problematic rule around a marginalised group, for example, something on gender or race or something on a, a bit of a, a section of a classification scheme or a topic in a classification scheme. That's that kind of deep analysis of, of, of an ethical issue often comes up and it's usually a deep analysis of the treatment of some form of marginalised group. So that's that makes up quite a bit of, of the research in this area, this kind of a subsection of knowledge organisation research. Um, which is which is centered on the ethics of knowledge organization. And there's a really interesting approach called ontogeny, which uh, Joe Tennis um, started his first article, not only first article, but the big article about this is on eugenics, a very problematic topic. And this is where you trace the treatment of a difficult subject over time in a classification scheme and see how it's changed and compare that to what was going on in society and literature at the time. So it's really fascinating. So to take away from that, Basically, there is some really, really interesting research on how um, marginalized groups have been treated in classification and cataloging and, and really looking at the theory and looking conceptually about um, what this means, how it's happened, and you know, trying to use theory to get to, to answer some questions about it. It's really, really interesting. However, um, ethical issues do extend beyond, um, beyond the treatment of, of marginalized groups, although that is, I, probably, I would say, is probably the biggest area. Um, there are some other other issues. So, for example, um, sometimes um, there's um, some unethical theories and movements like eugenics, um, and so there's there's ethical considerations about how you how you treat those. It's not specifically, it, it's not directly about a group, but kind of once removed from a marginalised group. And some interesting issues about truth and unreality. So, where things are shown to be fake, I'll talk a bit more about that later, which is another ethical issue. And actually, um, I read somewhere that. Um, you can even consider, it was a really interesting idea, which I really like, that you can even consider something like um, a backlog, a library backlog, as an ethical issue. So you're cataloging backlogs, it's been there for 10 years, maybe that only happens in the UK, but it's been there for 10 years. And that is, to some, it's a cataloging ethical issue because you're restricting access to things. So just from this slide, I would just say that um, ethics can be a very, cataloging ethics can be a very wide topic, a lot, quite, quite understandably, a lot of um, cataloging ethics is about the very poor treatment of marginalized groups in our systems and in our practices, um, but it does extend a bit wider. And I'll be talking about some of those extensions a bit wider um, right at the very end of this presentation. So just we'll, we'll, we'll go back to that. Um, but I'll be spending a lot of time talking about marginalized groups and probably most of the time on that kind of ethical issue. So the second section is to look at some of the eth ethical issues with the design of the cataloging um, guidelines and classifications. At this point, I'm just going to take a quick um, uh, a sniff and a drink. Great, right, I'm ready to go. So, our favourite, the Dewey Decimal Classification. Um, I don't know. I think I don't know even the first first bit of complaint about the Dewey Decimal Classification that went on, but I've certainly seen stuff from from a music perspective um, from. Uh, from a very long time ago, I think early 20th century. Anyway, um, so we all know that the Dewey Decimal Classification is very problematic in lots of ways, but in particular, in its very Western male Christian centric viewpoint. So unsurprisingly, Dewey presents a lot of ethical problems. So to get us into this topic, I thought I'd just give you, you know, a few of the highlights. Again, I could have spent an hour, probably a day talking about problems with the Dewey Decimal Classification. Um, but I wanted to give you some examples because then in the next slide, we're going to unpick what is going on um, with these sorts of things. We can understand what the problem is, the nature of the problem. So just to get us started, just a few highlights or lowlights. Um, we know that Christianity dominates the religion schedules um, in Dewey. So if you're a religion other than Christianity, you get whacked in the 290s, but everything else goes earlier. And moreover, um, although um, um, there's been changes over the years, particularly if you're not one of the three Abrahamic faiths, um, and you don't have the Bible, um, then um, you're even less likely to make it um, anywhere before 290. So though there's been changes to make, you know, some of the sections a bit more inclusive of other religions, um, actually, um, it's very still very um, Abrahamic faith, faith um, orientated as well. Now, I have to say, uh, Dewey have done amazing work, I think, personally, in my personal opinion, and they've come up with alternative schedules where you can put any religion at the front. So, you know, they are really, really working on this. Um, but Basically, the 
structure of Dewey is to have Christianity dominating the religion schedules. And we see a prioritization of Western languages and basically um, your main Indo-European languages take up, you know, most of the <laughs> most of the tables and um, both table six and then also in the 400s when you have works about languages and then stuck at the end is, is anything which isn't Indo-European. Um, and so what this means, of course, is French in table six has two digits and something like Zulu has six digits, which obviously has an impact and not only on where people find things, but also on um, how long your class marks are and how othered um, um, languages are and things like that. Um, and um, we also have similar problems in the literature uh, section. So a lot of the language, uh, the languages are generally used to make up the literature. So they kind of, unsurprisingly, um, the problems you see with, with languages uh, reappear in, in literature. So again, languages are othered, stuck at the end. Um, I think it's almost worse with literature because it's kind of an assumption in a way of a one language, one literature kind of um, situation, which isn't true. So um, I could have this wrong, but when I did have a look at South African literature, and you'll all hopefully correct me on this, but it looked like literature in English would be in the 820s and then Afrikaners would be in the 830s. Um, and then non-Indo-European languages uh, such as uh, 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 Zoom, if, right, um, would be probably in the 890s. So again, um, not just that you haven't got much space and things are squeezed in um, to places that, um, you know, right at the very end, which is which is not good from an ethical perspective, but also the fact that the literature of South Africa, I assume, is um, scattered. Now, I, 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 that was my reading of it, so please do. I'd be interested to know what happens in practice or if I got it right. Um, that was my reading. So that's problematic. Um, the other interesting thing about Dewey is that we also see... Um, how um how historically we can have problems which maybe don't exist later um so um homosexuality um was originally under a social deviance so this is interesting because it is something which has been improved and changed um which is good <laughs> but um it also shows you that there can be problems in hierarchies it's not just where something is or what number it's got now but the the offense and the unethical treatment can be in the hierarchy so you know it's where the parent subject is the one which which is really unethical and an unethical place for it. Um, and we have this problem of um, being um, othered as well. So for example, women can be added to any topic as an other. Um, but traditionally men, I don't know if men could or couldn't, but it's definitely more prominent for, for women, which is kind of interesting. Um, and of course, um, not everything is just about where things are. Uh, colonial geographic subdivisions is a big issue. Um, I know this is a big problem in indigenous communities in America. So you're cutting through, you've got your class mark for your indigenous community, but you have to cut through states, which um, are certainly um, not part of indigenous uh, knowledge um, organization for those communities. So it kind of hierarchies can be problematic. So it's not just about classes themselves in terms used to label those classes and how much space they have, they can be about the hierarchies. So what's going on with all of these? And generally, what are the problems in designs of systems? So this slide is my attempt to give not all, but some of the main ways unethical practices um, kind of present themselves in um, systems and classifications. And um, I'm not sure, I think someone might have their mic on. I don't know, this is, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Maybe it's me. Um, it sounds like someone's got their mic on. I don't know. Okay. Excellent. Great. <laughs> I don't mind. Um, uh, but yeah, I thought <laughs> I might get a bit of feedback. Okay, great. So what are some of the ethical issues that present themselves? What sort of type of issues do we get? Can we kind of categorize them? Because, you know, we're catalogers. We want to categorize the things we're categorizing, right? So coverage is one. So what we often find is a marginalized group or geographic region just simply receives less space. And this causes all sorts of problems. Um, long class marks, um, not being able to do things in detail because, you know, that nice European coverage, you know, has 50 classes, but your bit only has five. So you can't be as precise, you can't be as detailed. And that has an impact on your readers, but also it has uh, ethical issues as well about your knowledge um, not being as, as, um, as, as honored and respected. Uh, problematic terminology is a really interesting one. Um, this comes up in a few different ways. So um, you can get offensive labels and subject indexing and the illegal aliens example in discussion is a, is a very important one um, about this. Now, what's really interesting here is that, um, is that in things like Dewey Decimal Classification, actually 
our, our readers, our users of the library, generally don't see what we call something in Dewey. So if Dewey calls something really offensive, and I won't say an offensive word, but if they call something or someone something really offensive, the readers generally won't see that. It's horrible for librarians, the readers won't see that. Um, it's not good, but the readers won't see that. But if you have an LCSH subject term and you call it that offensive word, then that is there on the catalogue and that is really, really problematic from an EDI, from a diversity, from an inclusion perspective. So it's quite interesting that this issue has come up quite a lot more with LCSH than it has with, with Dewey and that, that I think is the reason why. Um, it's still problematic in both, I may add. And the other way that this comes up, I think is really, really interesting, is the ethical question of what you do when you've got, say, a book title which has a really offensive word in it. Now, maybe that word was okay 80 years ago, it probably wasn't, but you know, it, you wouldn't publish it, the book with that now, but maybe 80 years ago, unfortunately, it was accepted to do that. How do you treat that book? What do you do? Do you put a note on it? So that's another side to this problematic terminology issue. So some of our issues with catalog and classification ethics are about terminology. Problematic hierarchies are talked about a bit in the previous slide, but it's not just about where the terms are, but it's about what you get through to get there. And that can be problematic from an ethical perspective. Think, think about things like geographic subdivisions, uh, controversial countries even, where there's a dispute over who, um, who owns that country, who's, whose country that is, um, to think of some, but I won't mention them. Um, the cultural uh, bias is also a problem. So um, I'm using a music example here, so that's my background. Um, but um, for example, we often assume that um, music is Western art music. So, you know, you might have another little nice little other section for other music, but generally your forms, your genres, your mediums, your whole structure of music, your whole thinking about what's important to music is based on Western art music. That means like classical music being the default. And that's very problematic. Um, it's making an assumption um, um, that um, all some knowledge is more important than others, and that's that's not good. That's not ethical. Um, categorizations of people is problematic. I've got a quick slide on this coming up. Um, but sometimes cataloging asks you to categorize people, for example, by gender, and that's problematic. Can be problematic. Um, I think the other type of issue, which is really important, is is a kind of othering. So, for example, assuming that the default composer or artist, sorry, my art music background coming up here, assuming that the default composer or artist is male, and then you might have a heading for women composers or women artists. And you will not believe that LCSH still does this. So the default is they're male, and if they're women, well, that's special, so we put them in. Now, there are arguments that that can be useful for retrieval, very interesting arguments, um, but certainly it doesn't really help them um, in terms of, of, of inclusivity and them treating people equally. Um, and I also think there's just this general idea of calling regions and countries other. Um, and sadly, um, certainly in things like Dewey, um, um, Africa generally gets other, whereas European is the default. So I think there's a problem with othering, even if the users never see the word other, um, it's still kind of othering when you see it always stuck at the end, always in the 90s and things like that. Um, well, sometimes other numbers, but you know, you know, just always kind of stuck at the end. That's a problem. And the last point I think is just a really important one is that we think all about our classification and cataloging systems, but actually um, a lot of our, our systems, for example, how things, how terms get into Dewey Decimal Classification, how they get into Library of Congress classification, it's all about um, this idea of warrants. So, you know, is the idea justified in the knowledge? Um, but the problem is, um, when you think about things like literary warrants, so it is, you know, can we conclude this class? Has something been published about this? Has enough work been published about this interesting topic? Well, the problem is that that's based on the publishing industry. So I would argue that one of the issues we have to think about with, um, with ethics of, of classification in particular and, and cataloging too, is that we're relying on the knowledge produced being ethical. Um, and so we all know that there are problems with the publishing industry, it's a big general sweeping statement, but we know obviously that they have their own EDI issues, which obviously they're addressing, um, but they have their own issues with diversity inclusion. So our policies, decisions about how we structure our systems, well, you know, if we're basing them based on how things are published, then we're also basing them on, you know, potentially some unethical practices going on there. So I just think it's an interesting, an interesting issue to think about, um, and maybe something to think about when we're, when we're looking and designing systems. So just a very quick slide on this one. This is a second example. I just wanted to include it because it's quite different from the Dewey Decimal classification. Um, gender in RDA name authority records, a bit of an issue. This was something introduced in, in RDA um, 
but has been quite controversial and um, has since been rescinded, at least from being compulsory practice. Um, so basically, um, well, there's two issues. There's a general issue um, with, um, with just generally when you're differentiating names, um, including uh, material about uh, potentially dead names or names that people might have changed with very good reasons, for example, fleeing abuse or don't want to be named because it's politically quite dangerous for them to, to do so. So we, we do have to, to think about that. Um, um, I've said gender, but really all, all issues of names come under this, this, this idea of, um, of, of do we want to give names which the author, the creator themselves, haven't put on that item and they could have good reasons to do it. So that's interesting. And then there's a specific issue um, with gender and this RDA rule 9.7, um, which asks you to record gender, or at least um, I think the PCC and the NACO guidelines say you have to record it. Anyway, it's it's been rescinded. Um, amazing work um, uh, by um, Billy Drabinsky and uh, Roberto as well. I've given the, the article here, um, who wrote about a very classic article in 2014 and, and um, been working on it. Um, um, I think um, Amber Billy um, led the uh, working group about it um, and it's been rescinded now and the recommendation is not to do this um, but it just shows you another ethical issue it seems quite simple right in practice just put the gender on to help with the differentiation between names but actually comes up to be quite a problematic issue um, and this all brings up a very interesting issue of power and who's got the power um, to, to give information and how much power should authors and creators have and I think we're coming to an understanding I hope that they should have, have more, and particularly with information, uh, including information that could actually harm them. So that's a very quick whistle top uh, tour of um, problems in the designs of systems or unethical issues. There's so much more, but I hope that gives you something to think about. Um, but in the final section, I want to talk about some of the ethical, ethical issues from doing that cataloging, classification, and indexing. So. There are various decisions made by those who sit and do or stand and do the cataloging or creating the metadata in some way, whether they do it item by item or are um, ingesting, you know, 10,000 ebook records, whatever, whatever scale you're doing it on. There are certain ethical decisions made by those like yourselves and like me doing the cataloging and creating the metadata. Um, I like to call this kind of applied ethics, that's just my word for it, um, because I think it's a slightly different set of decisions from maybe the creation of schemes um, or something like that. And I think it's a really interesting question about who is our ethical responsibility to. Um, we think it's definitely to the, to the users, um, but how much is it to our organisations? How much is it to our creators? I just mentioned um, um, in the previous a slide about you know problems um, when you include names sometimes including names so you know our is our ethical responsibility also to our authors and our creators as well so you know when you're thinking about this and one of the questions is who is our ethical responsibility to now i would say that there are three main kind of ways that this um, research and thinking and the projects that are happening are kind of happening and um, the first is about codes of ethics and i'll get onto that and i know that's particularly important we are discussing today. Um, the, the second one, which I will I will just kind of do as a flourish at the end, um, is about specific types of resources which contain a very specific ethical issue. And I'll give some examples of that. And there are also some ethical considerations um, in applying cataloging guidelines and classification systems. Um, I'd say they're a little bit rarer in terms of research, um, but hopefully people are writing them as I speak. And um, I think that's a really interesting topic. So I won't talk about those because they're, they're a bit rarer. But, um, I will mostly talk about codes of ethics with a little bit about the type of resources because they're kind of fun and interesting. So codes of cataloging ethics. These are ideas of codifying and laying out a framework for the sort of values of the people sitting and doing the cataloging and the metadata. And interestingly, they usually describe the codes applied to the people, not of the practices themselves. They're about what a person should do, not about how the cataloging should be. And I think that's quite an important and useful distinction. Maybe it's just me, but I think it's quite interesting that that, that is where um, our focus on practice has been. So a very brief history. Um, uh, Bear wrote in 2005 a really important article which contains a cataloging code of ethics. And uh, she, identi she identifies um, the need for a code of ethics, um, but it's not taken up because as uh, uh, Elizabeth Shoemaker argues uh, later, um, in 2015, that actually we really need a committee, a group to create such a code of ethics, and it probably can't come from an individual person. 
Um, in the meantime, in 2009, um, IFLA produced a statement of international cataloging principles. And I'd be really interested to hear um, if you've come across them. Certainly on the ground as a cataloger, I hadn't come across these. I came across them when I started doing research into this area, but I actually haven't come across them as a cataloger of, of many years. And um, so I'm just kind of interested to see if you've come across them. Now, I find these really, really interesting. Um, so they're actually general cataloging principles, not specifically about ethics, but they've got some really useful ideas for ethics. And um, so uh, one of the points is the convenience of the user. Uh, one is about representation and one is about accuracy. And some of the tricky sorts of materials I'm going to very briefly mention later, um, you will see why they are quite useful points. Um, uh, and uh, Karen Snow writes an amazing article um, about something I will talk about in a minute called False Memoirs, um, but she actually draws on these a lot and she, it was her article which, which um, pointed these out to me. So um, it's, they're quite, it's quite interesting to have a look at. Um, she made the rights in 2015 um, about the codes of ethic must be drawn up by groups of librarians. And basically, essentially, discussion starts at various ALA meetings in 2016 and 2017, as far as I can ascertain. I think there were some initial meetings. So at this point, the UK find out what the US are doing. And um, CILIP, CIG, which is our cataloging and metadata group, um, we, uh, our, our chair, um, approached the US to ask, um, actually it wasn't the chair, it was a member of the committee, approached the chair and asked them whether we could do something together. So they started an international collaboration, or certainly with the UK joining. Um, and then basically, um, uh, they put out a call for members of uh, six working groups, um, and these were mostly drawn from the UK, US and Canada, but I had a quick look at the names, I definitely recognise the name from Israel, from Australia, and I'm sure there's a wider group there as well. Um, and they worked during, as far as I can understand, during 2019, 2020, to come up with a code, obviously COVID did, <coughs> did, direct, things. <coughs> did direct things slightly. Um, so they came up um, with a draft code, which came out in, I think it was June 2020, uh, it was revised and the final version came out in June, uh, sorry, in January, right Jay, in January 2021. And that is the code that you can see. And I know you've been given the link to the, um, the code of ethics, but it's really worth having a look at to see some of the background um, and um, actually look at the code, which is about one and a bit pages, so it's not too, too long a read. And so what does the code contain? Well, it starts, um, with very interesting uh, background to the code. Then it goes on to some very interesting definitions. I think it's quite interesting. They've got quite a, a narrow definition of, of a cataloging ethics there, which I find really, really fascinating. Um, and then there are 10 points. Um, this code is written at a very general level. Um, it's, uh, this is not a criticism, but it's not gonna tell you how to deal with that particularly tricky <laughs> ethical problem that you have right now. And what it also doesn't do, which the ICP did a bit more, is it doesn't say one rule is more important than the others. So it doesn't say, if these two rules clash, go for this one, which is quite interesting. So I picked out a few things. Um, I can't quite read it. Um, but the, um, uh, the first one, I can't quite read it on my slide. Oops, went backwards. Hang on, I'm just going to get this to move. I can't quite read it. Um, can't remember what I've highlighted. Yes, I think the first one is about users, I'm going to guess. The first one is about users. So users are there and they're really, really important. Um, so that's very interesting. Second point I think I wanted to bring out um, was that agents are there. So they're really, really important. Now, this is interesting. The wording of number two has changed a bit through draft. Um, and this is showing the importance that you give to the voice of, of those creating the resources, which hasn't always been um, codified in some of the writings about cataloging ethics. Um, interestingly, they were called something different, creators, and um, I think agents is a bit broader, and we can understand that in, the, in, a, in an RDA, in, a, in an LRM, had a terminology to mean everybody, even, you know, the publisher or, you know, any individuals at any level of, of WEMI, rather than just creators. Um, and it's interesting to see the word privacy here, which I think covers some of our, our, our gender issues that we, that we talked about before. So I think that's really interesting, and something I, you know, feel quite strongly should, should be there for my own research. Um, I've just randomly rung the word we here, which you probably can see on my screen, you can see me going around, but I've rung, rung the word we here, um, it's a bit of a random word, but what I wanted to emphasise um, is that this is about our own practices and us taking responsibility as individuals, I think this is a really interesting aspect um, to the code, um, so it's acknowledging our own um, uh, shortcomings, I guess, but you know, our own um, biases and what we can, what we can do to do about that, um, which I think is interesting. It's kind of like a, a kind of a commitment to trying to do our best to overcome them, but admitting 
that we actually have them, which I think is, is really interesting in kind of context of debates about neutrality. Um, I also think um, number eight is interesting because it talks about the workplace. And this is really fascinating because this means you can't really do much about this as a catalogue or even as a head of cataloging. So this is suggesting that the code to be fully accepted, perhaps the code needs to be something taken much further up in your organisation to the head of library or even further up. So I find this really, really fascinating from a research perspective. Um, and I'm really interested to hear and people who may be looking at this and adopting this, what they'll what they'll do about this one, because it it kind of needs to come, kind of all all the way all the way up really to to be able to do this. Because as an individual cataloger, I can't insist on diversity, equity, or inclusion in the workplace. I'm kind of at the mercy of my of my managers. Always had lovely managers, but you know. Um, and the last one, um, ten. So I should have explained. I've just highlighted. I couldn't get them all on the slide. I've just highlighted five of the ten. There are ten. I'm just just to see if anyone's awake. There are actually ten. Um, the last one I wanted to highlight was how it talks about user communities. And I think this is really, really interesting um, because it shows that, that the, the way forward for thinking about ethics is not for us to sit in our cataloging offices, we still got them, and, and to impose our views, but really to go out and talk to the community. And which has been happening with things like Dewey Decimal Classification for, for quite a few years now. Um, but it's really nice to see this codified. So I think there's some really interesting points about this code of ethics, and I'd be really interested to, to hear what, what your progress and what your thoughts are about it. And finally, um, uh, in terms of us uh, having cat um, ethics of our, of our cataloging practices, I do think that there is another interesting uh, angle to this, aside from codes of practice um, for our, for our behaviour and our principles. And then this is, the sorts of things that you get when you you get a problematic item so these are these are issues which don't come up in the design of your classification scheme your cataloging scheme these are all about the sorts of decisions you have to make on the ground often with an item by item basis but usually sort of the researchers kind of group them together so very quickly because i know i'm very short of time now um the first one is absolutely fascinating, but it's about when you have a problem with the space between fiction and non-fiction. So Karen Snow writes a brilliant article about this, um, and she calls um, a group of works called False Memoirs. And these are works which are presented as being my memoir of my life. Um, and then it turns out, usually later, that you made it all up, or some of it up, or it's not really true. And of course, the library has um, made a very big distinction between whether to, to class this and to keep this, store this, organise this as fiction or non-fiction. And it turns out later that it is um, really, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not really uh, non-fiction after all, and it shouldn't be in the autobiography section. So this is really interesting, and so it's interesting discussion and research about that. Um, so um, if you work in a library with fiction, maybe a public library, you might have seen some of these a bit more. Um, deception and unreality is a topic very close to my heart, and I've written about this from an artistic perspective. So this idea of deceiving your readers and putting something on the book which isn't true is a very long-standing issue. If you think about pseudonyms and things which pretend to be other things, it's a very long-standing issue. Poems which tend to have been written by, you know, someone but written by someone else authors going under different names all sorts of things to do with deception and unreality and this creates really interesting issues for the cataloger about what they should put on their catalog record and what they shouldn't should they put a note or shouldn't they should they sort of out the person shouldn't they should they let the artistic vision take over or not which is something that I looked at with them um, some work on artworks and, and this coming up and um, this example the third one is what we could call bad works or bad books there's a really interesting article by Homan about this. I'll put it on the bibliography. Um, and this one is where you get um, where you get a book or a title, um, or just actually the book itself is bad. It's about a topic which we don't want to read about, <laughs> like eugenics, and has been discredited in some way. Now your library has it because it's an important historical document, but there's a really big question about what you should do with it. Should you warn the readers? How should you classify it? Um, there was an interesting discussion in um, in the UK oh, about eight years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, can't remember, um, about a book about Holocaust denial and looking at the classification of that. Um, and that sort of um, idea is very, very interesting. So what you should do with them. So that's the sort of issue which no classification scheme is going to tell you how to deal with. But as a cataloger on the ground, um, it, is, it presents to you an interesting issue of ethics. Um, and I've just put this one down here. Um, um, for this audience, <laughs> but I don't know how much of a problem this is for you. Um, but I do think that, personally think that, that cataloging systems um, do sort of have an assumption, sort of the workings of them, mechanics of them kind of have an assumption 
of monolingualism as in just in one language and don't necessarily aren't necessarily set up for a multi-language environment things like codes for you know codes for languages and a mark 21 record and things like that um so um yeah i just just wondered if this was this this was an issue um for you i know it can be an issue in in, in some places um but i think it is another interesting sort of ethical issue dealing with certain types of materials or being in certain uh, cataloging environments um and i do think there's kind of an assumption that um you know your library catalog uh, will be based in say one language and, and things like that and everything set up and particularly for roman script as well so um I just thought I'd add that one in as an ethical issue. So I promise this really is the last slide. <laughs> so concluding points. So obviously I've absolutely went through a whole load of issues, not really answering everything, but just presenting to you some of the amazing array of things to think about. Um, so hopefully you feel <laughs> feel like um, we've got through a lot. Um, so the, one of the big points I would say is that I think it's interesting to think about there being ethical issues in the systems and the guidelines, things like RDA and Dewey, and there being a separate set of ethical issues when we're actually trying to create metadata for a specific resource or a specific collection or a specific library. Sometimes they overlap, but I think it's quite interesting to think about them as being slightly different things. And certainly if you've got a user complaining to you about the ethics, um, they have a right to complain, but you might, it might help you to, sometimes, can help to think about them as different, as different ideas, because obviously you've got different sets of control depending on um, which one it is. Um, I'd also say that there is rarely a straightforward answer to an ethical problem. Um, you know, changing a class mark can sound easy, but the impact on that on, you know, Dewey's hundreds, thousands, thousands of hundreds of thousands of users around the world um, can be really problematic. So, you know, it's not always about a lack of will, but um, everything we make, every ethical decision we make has has implications, um, some of which are unethical because they require catalogers to work overtime unpaid to sort them out for example so they, it's really interesting but you, you try and sort something out and you can actually create a new um, ethical problem and this is something I think we have to be aware of when we're, when we're undertaking ethical cataloging projects and because maybe our library users or other people in the library don't quite understand the implications they don't always know what it's actually like to make changes to the catalogue um, or changes to the, the, cl the classification scheme they may not see those impacts and so we have to kind of try and explain it and educate them on that. Um, I think that um, my impression, certainly in the UK, is there's absolutely no lack of will to be more ethical. Absolutely nothing could be further from the truth. Everybody wants it. Um, but there are barriers, and I think we do, without sounding negative, I do think we need to acknowledge them and try and work around them, because we, need, but we do need to acknowledge that their um, resources, money, time, staff, and political obstacles, we saw this with illegal aliens, but also, you know, Sometimes what's important to us may not be important to, you know, the director on which our library sits, for example. Sorry, I'm not having to go to senior managers, but you know, you know, it, it might be important to us as in our team, but not necessarily um, higher up or, or with the kind of strategic aims of the university or the public library system or the national library at that time. Um, I also think that there's very interesting uh, tension between the local needs of our users and global cataloging. Again, difficult decisions. If you want to make something better for your users are much more um, ethical, then you might have to move away from global cataloging, which sounds fine, but can have implications. And those implications be very long standing in terms of you know, the rest of the, the life of the catalog having to change things as they come in because you make the decision now. Um, and it doesn't mean that's a wrong thing to do, but it does mean that it's, it's a big and difficult decision to make. But leaving you on a positive note, um, I'm just, it's just so exciting right now. There are so many great projects, great initiatives, research and um, interest from students and new professionals. There's, there's, there's so much going on. Um, I know in the UK and um, I know outside as well. Um, so, you know, we know that there are huge and really long standing issues with cataloging ethics, but I do really think that, that things are coming together. And it's why it's so exciting to be part of this event today. Um, and I also think that um, as well as just being about cataloging ethics, um, from my research, my small amount of research into cataloging ethics, I do think that when we start trying to understand the source and the technicalities of ethical issues, which I hope in a very small way I've um, tried to do what I've tried to do today, um, I think it can help us to understand more deeply generally what it means to, to catalogue and classify. Um, and that's, that's me done. Sorry for overrunning.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lee, for giving us an overview of the cataloging and, and classification ethics, as well as highlighting various ethical issues that you can look at. This is indeed a call for discussion and engagement within the South African LIS um, professionals. Uh, let me quickly uh, run through our program. Uh, next, we will have a, a Q&A that will be led by Ingrid. And then after the Q&A, we'll have a five minute uh, body break. And then when we come back, um, Fatima, our chairperson, will lead uh, the way forward uh, for uh, South African um, cataloging ethics. So Ingrid, over to you. So I hope if Thank you very much. So I hope everybody is back. Uh, we have decided, colleagues, that we will um, record this part of the session uh, after some discussion, uh, because it's the first conversation that we're having around the topic, and we thought it's important that people's initial thoughts and responses and ideas and whatever else is recorded. So in this part of the session, um, although my name is next to it, let me not um, let, let me uh, uh, remove the idea that we have a fixed idea of how to go forward other than uh, that um, we will, um, uh, we, we, we certainly need to continue to address the topic and to see what, um, how it um, manifests uh, in the South African context. So let me reflect a little bit uh, and just uh, go a little bit back to tell you how we came to be uh, this morning. Uh, one of our bright young professionals on the executive committee, Sarah Galway, um, uh, put us on this uh, journey um, and very, uh, very um, timelessly, the analog copy of the March um, Liasa in Touch um, was delivered to my door and the article um, that Sarah did on her attendance of the uh, December session uh, which was a webinar hosted by Arliss, uh, is in that, is, is in the issue, so it's on page seven. I did try and see if I could show you um, this image a little bit earlier on, but because I have a virtual background, you won't be able to see it. So it's the March issue of the Lia Sign Touch, and it's on page seven. Um, we then um, tried to find South African uh, colleagues who were interested in the topic or uh, would consider speaking about it. And although there was a lot of interest, uh, nobody wanted to present. I think that for us, it's a very new topic still. Um, so uh, we have some questions that we would like to ask. This was done because we wanted to try and get as much participation and, and, and views expressed as possible. And we thought this would be the best way to do it rather than to have small breakaway groups and then it would take time for everybody to report back. Um, but before we go into that, I think what I'll do is we'll just open the floor again. If there's anything anybody would like to add or to say, um, please feel free to do so or to put it in the chat. Given it a, a few minutes. Um, so I think no, it looks like nobody uh, wants to add anything uh, or have any other burning questions. I just wanted to pick up on something on the chat, colleagues. As Is it Susan or Susan wrote, there are a few people here who worked on IFLA's cataloging statement during 2007, just prior to the IFLA conference in Durban. I wonder if uh, those colleagues would like to say something or if Sus uh, Susan or Susan would like to say something. Um, hi, it's Susan, yeah. Um, 
we were we were involved tinny was actually the person who arranged it just prior to that ifla conference and so there are people who have looked at those in depth and we could possibly build on on um what was discussed then or our impressions our, our sense of what the cataloging principles were all about then and build it to a new statement. Mm. Do, do, you, do you want to speak a little bit about what the thinking was around that at the time, uh, um, Susan? Um, Tini, if you can also just st uh, step in and help out. And I think Hester is also here. She was also involved. Um, it was led by international um, presenters and we discussed it in detail then. Um, so we were definitely led more by the international um, uh, presenters. So, um, but definitely it was, it was an important development at that time. We definitely need to look at it from a, a different perspective now because 13 years, 13, 15 years ago, was a while back and and things have changed a lot since then you know, socially and culturally thank you susan i think i see tini's hand is up sorry colleagues i think i shared the wrong screen i wanted to show you um what um i found it's called let me just get to the top of the, the document um, it was done in 2009, I think finally it was uh, ratified and then later versions were finished by 2017. So it's the IFLA uh, Statement of International Cataloging Principles. That's the one that you're talking about, Susan? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Tini, do you want to go ahead? Yes, um, thank you, Fatima. <clears throat> yes, before the... Um, uh, 2007 um, IFLA meeting, um, the catalog cataloging community uh, was invited by Barbara Tillett, who was at that time um, organizing um, worldwide um, uh, over a few years. The, um, the catalogers' uh, perception and their knowledge about certain principles. We were divided into various groups and working groups, <clears throat> um, they were uh, guiding questions, as Susan said, and all that working groups um, <clears throat> discussed it in detail and come up with, with an answer or, or um, yeah, shall I say an answer to that questions. And there was also um, a publication made available <clears throat> um, and it is in the IFLA series of publications, <clears throat> pardon. I can follow up um, the reference um, uh, and make it available, but I agree with Susan that um, it might be a, quite an interesting exercise to see how our thinking compares then with now. Uh, and I think it is a, it is a very constructive departing point uh, for South Africa, if South Africa wants to formulate its own statement um, on this um, ethical question regarding cataloging and, and classification. So I just, uh, Dr. Lee asked uh, somewhere, thank you, Tini. Dr. Lee asked somewhere if anybody has come across it. Um, um, and I also have not come across it, Dr. Lee, until I did some research for, for, the, for this webinar. Um, I had a look at it, uh, Tini, and I, I want to agree with you because I think the thinking and, and the um, um, society has has uh, changed significantly from 20, even 2017 to, 20, to uh, when this was ratified and, and published to 2021 when the North American um, Code of Ethics were uh, finalized. Um, one of the things that I picked up immediately in the principles is, for example, uh, um, no, I'm sorry, I can't share it. I'm not just keep to share because I think I'm going to share the wrong screen again. Um, but one of the items is um, convenience of the user. 
And I think it's very interesting that uh, Dr. Lee asked, who is our responsibility to? Is it to the user? Do we have a responsibility to the creator, for example? Um, and, and will those necessarily fit together? Will they always be in alignment? But the one that really sort of stuck out in me was 2.2 common usage. Now, this is in the principles, um, the EFLA principles. So I'm, I'm just going to read from it. Vocabulary used in descriptions and access points should be in accordance with that of the majority of users. But if the majority of users are calling, for example, another group of people by a term that those people find derogatory or it's not the term that they use to refer to themselves, common usage, in my opinion, my set of values and from my ethical perspective is then incorrect. Um, and so it's uh, Tina's earlier question about, you know, whose ethical point of view and are we really just talking about inclusivity inclusivity um, when we're talking about ethics. Um, so, so I do think um, uh, Susan, Tini, um, Hester, if you are here, I think um, one could pick our perspective up from the IFLA um, set of principles it is an option. Uh, we could also have a look at the um, the North American examples, see how they, you know, try them on, see how they fit, um, and 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 see um, whether they fit this South African uh, context. I'm also somewhat reluctant to have very long sort of sets of principles. Um, I see the if the one is uh, there's there's about thirteen uh, principles, uh, broad principles that they're talk, talking about. Um, so we so there's a there's a there's a there's an option to have a South African one and then there's an option to feed into the bigger IFLA one and have a, a global one that we all uh, support. Um, those are options that we can explore and I'd love to hear some more thoughts and viewpoints. Um, I also thought Cornell, who who uh, was very really courageous with this one to ask the question, those hundreds of things that were going through your mind, what were they? If you feel comfortable sharing. I hope she's still here. It looks like uh, she uh, has already left. Um, and then while I was speaking, I heard uh, some, um, I heard something, but did somebody want to say something or add anything? Uh, uh, Susan? Um, when we're looking at this, I think we need to remember that we, we operate within an international environment, but that we have a, a, a a multicultural country. Um, yeah, all the all the official languages, all the future official languages, plus all the cultures. And how do we balance between the international environment, the international views, and also um, promoting the, our South African views? Yeah, I I, I can't agree with you more. Um, I. Uh, so it's a complex issue, and certainly I don't think it's something that we uh, uh, can address in one session, and that's why we're talking about a journey. Um, but by the um, the number of people in the room and the registrations and so on, I think it's something that uh, has found um, um, uh, resonance uh, with many people. Um, and I and I'm and I, I I think it's appropriate at this time that we just begin to engage and you know looking critically at our practice um, and not being the somewhat powerless recipients of um, a, um, a, a, a English speaking dominant um, worldview that we also bring to the international stage our local experience. Um, Tini I see you've got uh, your hand up. Susan is giving me a thumbs up. Tini, do you want to go ahead? Yes, um, I just want to say that this topic is really um, new to me. Mm. Um, um, 
I was wondering if there's um, some reading matter that we can follow up just to um, to inform us a little bit more and uh, broaden our vision um, about uh, what what is at stake. So mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Lee uh, did give some some um, some references. But I think um, that would be good if, if if we if we have a sort of a core list that we can refer to just to just to inform us a little bit more about the topic. So I'm going to ask the, uh, Dr. Lee if if you are willing. Would you, uh, the uh, Tini? Uh, we will share Dr. Lee's um, uh, slides. There is a reference. A, a list of resources, Dr. Lee, uh, in your slides um, towards the end. Would you mind just uh, sharing that particular piece if it's not too much of a of an of a of a challenge? Hello. Um. Sorry. When when you say share, I'm probably being very slow this morning. Um. No, no, I, it's okay. Do you, do you mean put it on the screen? Yes, or? I mean the slide. Yeah. Your oh, slides. okay. Sorry. <laughs> Bit of a warning. Um, okay. Sorry, I was just, probably not very clear. No, no, it was fine. I'm just, <laughs> I've never worked out how to do, um, yeah, <laughs> I was trying to work out how I was to do it. Hang on, just give me a second. Okay, so sorry, you can probably all see <laughs> my slides. Now let me do this. I'm just going to slideshow. So what I've done is, and I'm really happy to share, and I just said, I've actually sent it off ready to share, is there's so much reading on this, but um, I put together three slides and also some other people have done some bibliographies already of cataloging ethics um so these are quite quite useful um and one thing i will just say is one of the interesting ethical issues about <laughs> cataloging literature is that i don't know what it's like for all of you but in the uk many of us work in libraries which has no access to uh, journals about librarianship um so some of these are unfortunately um not open access um but um I would always just say that a lot of the time people are putting their work on, particularly recent work, on repositories um, and things like that. So hopefully, even if you don't have access to, say, um, uh, one of these journals, um, you would be able to get it. And also Knowledge Organisation is mostly open access now as well. So just to say, I'm sorry that some of these are actually behind uh, paywalls, which is kind of goes against the whole principles of what we're talking about. Um, but um, uh, the, the, the reading lists aren't, and some of these can be found in other ways, if that makes sense. Well, well, we are librarians and we do know how to find information. So if we, <laughs> if, <laughs> course, we sorry, if, yeah. yes, if we if we can't find it uh, uh, with a particular uh, publication, if you do a search for it, you're most likely to find a preprint version of it uh, or some version of an open access copy of it. Um, uh, Tini, uh, I think that was that is quite a, you know, quite a good list to start off with. So we will share the, yeah, I've got a thumbs up from Tini. Um, so I think what we'll do, let me just check the room. Yep. Tini, you have another, you have another question? Oh, okay. There's a thumbs up. <laughs> okay. Um, let me just check the room, colleagues. Uh, any burning issues, thoughts, ideas, comments? Okay. So what I'll, uh, what we'll do now is we will uh, ask you to answer just a couple of questions. Kahusa, uh, if you are ready, so we will use the Zoom facility for it. Uh, so you should see on your screen now, the first question is ethics and cataloging and metadata description in South Africa, an important issue. So you get a yes or no. If you could please complete, a, uh, select one of those two and then submit. Oh, I should also do it, right? Okay, so otherwise you can't get to the next slide. Yes, Fatima. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sitting and I'm looking at this thing. Why is it not moving? Um, I mean, um, how do we see the response? Will you share it? Will you share the video? Yes, I'm going to okay. share the results. All right. All right. I'm just going to mute. I've got some background noise going on in the office here, colleagues.
Okay, so there we are. Overwhelmingly, um, a yes. Um, anybody would, uh, and one, uh, well, 2% no. Anybody would like to speak to the outcome of that, uh, of, of that question? So I see an overwhelming yes from what I from, from my my take on things. Okay, thank you very much, Akafisa. We can have the next question. Are you able to address ethical concerns in cataloging description uh, practice in your daily work? So it's a yes or no. Um, I suspect there may be. I'm not sure. Uh, answer to this as well. So we can always discuss that um, when um, when we see the results. Okay, so it's somewhat in the middle um, with the majority going to no. Uh, so everybody can see what I'm seeing, right? Yes, Fatima. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Risa. Um, so my, let me share with you what I, what I answered. I said yes, because I think that uh, these are, this is the reason why I've said yes. DOE allows you to make a submissions uh, to the editorial committee, they will review it. And they will um, approve it or they'll discuss it. And there will be, but there is a there is a way that it can be addressed. So that's to be Library of Subject Congress headings as well. You can make submissions to the Library of Congress uh, to change uh, or to add um, uh, um, the subject headings. Um, so that's what my um, uh, my yes was based on. Would anybody like to share around that question? If you answered no, yes, uh, what what you what your thoughts were? Timmy, okay. I see your hand. Thanks, Fatima. <clears throat> I think that um, perhaps uh, we we need to consider um, if you've answered yes, uh, which I did, uh, also the level of sufficiency. Mm. So uh, Dewey might perhaps uh, give you broad guidelines, and as you uh, as you also mentioned, there's uh, there's options to um, to add uh, or to to review. But I think that uh, so we need to address the level of of sufficiency or of specificity um, to 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 address. Yeah. So it's more of a uh, what what Dr. Lee would say. It's not so much a practice as it is a design uh, level. Uh, Nikki. You, you Hi, Fatima. Ahead. Sorry, I was one of those people who was on mute again. <laughs> <laughs> we all do um, that. Yes. Um, I'd like to, to say I haven't attended an ICBIS meeting for ages, and I really feel now that I've been missing out on things. So I'd like to thank the ICBIS committee for putting this, um, this workshop here today together. And it's really, really a thought-provoking topic. And it's actually hit home with me because as a cataloger for many years, it's sometimes not easy to put your own, um, let me say, prejudices, because that is really what it is to one side. And I think one needs to be honest and open about that when cataloging material. So um, I think this definitely is something that is, is worthwhile for discussion. Um, I would like to make a proposal that ICBIS, as the committee actually um, runs with this and um, pulls other people online or, or you know, onto, onto a committee uh, who can assist with this, 
Um, I also think that um, I also answered yes to this. And I think it also depends on your position with an, within an organization as to how much control you have there. And then finally for Tim, I'd just like to say, um, and I know Susan will, will um, help me here. We used to, from the National Library's perspective, um, suggest certain subject headings. I think that was then taken over by UNISA. Um, you did you did say that um, earlier on that we can um, um, suggest subject headings. Um, if you could perhaps just tell us who it is that we could um, could send these suggestions to as well. Thanks for Tima. Also great to see you again. Thank you, Nikki. Um, thanks for for your um, for three things that I want to pick up. Um, I, I, we uh, thank you for saying. You know, it's an important issue and that the ICBIS committee must uh, continue on with it. That is very much along our uh, thoughts as well, uh, as well as uh, there are only four members on this committee. Um, Nikki, and I think having served on this committee yourself before, you'll know that it gets taken up, uh, uh, matters time of the committee gets taken up with other issues. So we definitely wanting, to, uh, and this will be one of the questions we'll ask later on, wanting people to volunteer to make themselves available to even if we decide we're not going to have a code of ethics of our own, but to certainly to continue to work on this area, uh, build the knowledge um, about uh, ethics in cataloging and, and within, with, with specifically within the South African context, in particular, bearing in mind multi multilingualism, as Susanna pointed out earlier, um, specific user communities um, who are not represented. Um, I think I just spoke about redress. Um, um, so we are hoping that people will make themselves vulnerable. So we get, we're getting to that point. Um, the, um, the Library of Congress subject leading submissions, as I understand it, Nick, is open to every library. Uh, I don't think it needs to be funneled through a particular uh, organization, um, but I will uh, stand corrected. And let me just call on my, on my, on my colleague, uh, uh, Hester, if you're still in the room, is I think there is a committee at Library of Congress who looks at it. I don't know if we have any details uh, that we can share at the moment. So I'll just ask Esther to come in. I hope she's still here. I know that she had some difficulty with Zoom on her laptop. Okay. All right, but it, it's something that we can share. Um, I'll just make a note of it to share the LC. Maybe I can do the South African because the South African uh, editor for Dewey is in fact at UNISA and we can share Dr. Fat the Yagas uh, uh, contact details for colleagues. Um, there was also, ICBIS also did a presentation, a webinar last year, I think, on, uh, on, 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 De on Dewey um, and how to make submissions, uh, I think. So we'll, we can uh, follow up with those details as well. Library of Congress subject heading submissions. Um, there's a subject heading one, and then there's, of course, a name authority one. And the name authority one, that you can definitely be in contact with Dr. Hester uh, Marie, uh, who is, in fact, at UNISA. I hope that answers, um, I, I hope I've answered all of your questions, Nikki. You can just pipe in again if I haven't. Everything's uh, fine, thank you, Fatima. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I see there's a note. Well, in the chat, there's a message uh, from Karen Oxley. Okay, shall I read it out, Karen, or would you like to speak? Good morning. Good Thank morning. you. If I may, um, I'm a bit little with, uh, with uh, putting up my hand. Um, Yes, I'll, I'll just read out what I, I found it very informative today. It's a quite a new topic for myself. And there have been some issues that I've looked at, especially in terms of the Papier Act, um, with regard to um, certain, if, if you have a creator or author, author and, you, and especially for the living, if you put their birth dates, if you don't have, um, uh, I'm in a special library and um, do not necessarily um, 
so it is in our online catalog for our organization only. And if you go strictly according to rules and, and, and sometimes you need to put in dates and so forth for birth dates and also the full names of people where, as it is in the, the theses and so forth, but then they go generally by the um, uh, uh, general name that they have it's not their full names mm. and I've had issues with that in the past and I think now there's some definite changes I will be bringing uh, in our in our skid catalog with regard to that and also if you look at um, what I can also think is disputed uh, uh, what was previously mentioned is um, disputed uh, geographical place names and uh, other sensitive topics um, that, that that may arise in certain collections. Um, what I just um, noted here, the ethics and classification catalog is definitely a fairly new topic to myself and may, be as, uh, may as well be to others in the session today. I do however envision that from uh, today's awareness session and in the way forward, we as catalogers would be able to make a difference. And, and also to sensitize others uh, with regard to this, just to add. Mm. And I just want to thank the IGPES team for bringing this to us. And what intrigued me from Dr. Lee when she mentioned was perhaps some, what I would like to learn more about um, and some more elaboration in what is um, uh, uh, on ethical issues in uh, job shadowing or work experience. I found that an intriguing um, point to, to mention. Um, because sometimes we here at work do have, um, or in the past, definitely had um, job shadowing. And it would be interesting to, to now can't really think of what ethical issues that might come up. But that's a really mm, interesting mm, thing to learn mm, more about that. But mm. thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Th thank you, Karen. So Karen was referring to the, um, uh, uh, the personal information. Act, which is we either we you either say Poppy Act or Papaya Pop Popia, P O P I A, um, which was uh, came into operation I think mid year last year if I'm not mistaken, uh, um, and certainly uh, we all had to sort of take a moment to, to reflect on it and and how it ref and how it bears uh, on the creation of authority names for example but basically if the information is in the public domain you can use it i hope it is um but certainly I, um it said it would be an interesting topic as well to explore so not just an ethical matter but also a legal and legislative matter um, I think Kajiso, we are standing at 11:47. i think we better get on with those questions so we've got a few more So I will just give you an opportunity to answer the question. Yeah, there is the response. Ninety percent says, "Yeah, we need more. We need more engagement." So we'll we'll take note of that. Thanks very much, Kafisa. We can go ahead to, uh, to the next question. Okay, colleagues, you can see the next question question on your screen. Give a moment to answer. We can go to the next question, Professor. Was that the last question? Oh. Do you support the development of a South African code of ethics? 
again overwhelmingly yes thank you very much now there we go so colleagues um all of the other questions were anonymous this one will not be so that we could pull the names so i'm just gonna i'm gonna answer it as well Kahisa, would we be able to see the results of that last question? Yes, Fatima, just give it 10 more minutes. I'm seeing there's okay. still more people who are voting. All right. Thanks All right. very much. Kahisa, we do have Dr. Lee's um, deck of slides available. Um, is this something that you could do? Or is it something that the ICPAS committee will undertake to share with the attendees today? You can email it to me. I will share I email uh, with the attendees with the uh, with, yes, with the recording okay. as well. Excellent. Thank you. I'll send it off immediately. Right, All right, there are the results. Thanks very much. Um, yeah. Um, so that is okay because uh, uh, we need what we'll need to do is to put together a task team, right? So uh, for for um, for the purposes of making progress, thirty three percent is a good. I guess it would be around one third of the people in the room. So we are talking about um, I don't know, maybe twenty people. So yeah, thanks very much, colleagues. So we did have some open-ended questions, um, which I thought I would ask, but given that we are now at 11.51, I think that we better get on with the rest of the program. <laughs> so thank you very much, colleagues, for your engagement and your participation and coming out, um, uh, because the only indication that we have as a uh, committee, whether we are addressing the issues that are um, of, of interest to you is through your attendance. Um, so thank you very much for coming out and making um, yourselves available to attend the session. I will uh, close the session now and hand over to Sarah, who will close the uh, uh, webinar for us. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Fatima and colleagues. Um, and I will start uh, closing, I'll start closing off the session. <laughs> First, I would like to say thank you very much to Dr. Deborah Lee for generously offering up your time and energy this morning and for providing uh, a fascinating framework for our own national conversation that we were able to begin today. Um, thank you to my fellow IGBIS committee members and Kakiso and the LIASA National Office for their technical assistance and expertise during the setting up and hosting of this event. And most importantly, thank you to everyone who attended and participated in today's event. It's, uh, I feel, uh, an imperative conversation to have um, in, in the national context and something I feel that, that we as South African catalogers and metadata practitioners can can uh, provide to the greater community. Um, with that said, um, generally after our IGBIS events, we like to take a, an attendee photograph of um, everyone who joined us. So if you would like to participate, we please ask if you could um, switch your cameras on. Of course, if you're not comfortable, you may leave your cameras off. Um, but if everyone would like to do that, uh, Kafiso will take a few screenshots of everyone. Um, so hopefully we get to see everyone who, who joined us today. It'd be lovely to see your faces. See some more portraits popping up. It's lovely to see everyone.
Okay, everybody can smile. Okay, one last one. There we are, all good. Perfect, thank you so much, Kofisel. And again, thank you every everyone. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Take care out there. And uh, I hope we, we get to see you all again soon for another conversation. Um, best wishes to everyone. Thank you.